Hey everyone, this is Mike Wolf, and welcome to the Food Tech Show. Today's guest is Miyoko Shinner, a longtime plant-based food entrepreneur. I'd had a chance to meet Miyoko earlier this year where I moderated a virtual session at a virtual conference and just really enjoyed talking to her. And so I thought I'd bring her on the podcast, and she did not disappoint. We talked about her journey from becoming a vegan in the 80s to her first company she started in the 90s. We talked about the book she wrote and you know becoming a chef. And finally, we talked about Miyoko's Creamery and the plant-based cheese category and, and butter category and how she really has helped create that. As is usual these days, we recorded this live on Clubhouse. So if you want to listen to these, make sure you join our club on Clubhouse Food Tech Live, and you can listen in when we record these. All right, that's it for now. Let's get to my conversation with Miyoko Shinner. I'm here with Miyoko Shinner. Um, Miyoko, you've been a, a plant-based food entrepreneur for, I think, for going on decades now. And <laughs> we'll get into all that. But uh, and you, you've, you're a lot more than that, right? You're also a, a chef, an author, a true Renaissance person doing all these different things. So you, it's still, certainly very impressive. But I'm excited to have this conversation with you because I think you're one of the, the most important people in the space. You really kind of created the plant-based cheese category. So I just want to get into all that. But before we do all that, maybe we could kind of go back to the early days because you, I think, transitioned to becoming a vegan like back in the 80s. That was what was oh, the yes. thinking? Was this was it just your diet? It just wasn't working for you? Yeah. You know, I, I, I was living in Japan at the time. And as it, well, you know, I was I had, was had been a vegetarian for many years already by then. Um, and I had started eating fish because it was so hard to eat vegetarian even in or vegan in japan um meaning there really weren't many options for vegetarian food they didn't have dairy and i think when you're a vegetarian you eat a lot of dairy products yeah um and then when you decide to go vegan you have to give up dairy as well it became it became quite a challenge um but when i was eating fish in japan and you know i fish had creep kept back into my life after not eating it for a number of years um I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, I stopped eating animals when I was 12 years old because I didn't want to harm them. And now I'm eating sea life. And and so that began to really disturb me. Um, and of course, I had started eating fish out of convenience living in Japan. Um, but the other issue was that I think I was allergic to dairy. Um, when I gave up dairy about three months later, all of a sudden, you know, this, this co constant digestion issue I had had just gone away. And I just hadn't, um, put two and two together to realize, um, you know, the impact of, of lactose and, and milk protein on a lot of uh, people of color, people who are not of a Northern European, um, a Northern European stock. Yeah. And so you, you decided to cut out the fish. I think, you know, that's such a relevant conversation. Now we could talk maybe about seaspiracy later. Um, but this idea of just adjusting your diet and seeing miraculous results, I think you were doing that early. I think a lot of people, and it's, it's become more of a, the conversation, I think in the past decade or so, but just kind of experimentation. And you found that out. And I think it's interesting. You say like uh, I, the European diets more oriented around just consumption of dairy, but those not from that, uh, that don't descend from there have more problems with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, living in Japan, dairy w had not been part of my life when I was a child and had immigrated to the United States. And then back living in Japan in the 1980s, it was very, very hard to find dairy. So it was hard to be, it sounds weird, but it was weird to be or try to be a vegetarian in a country where um, if you took away the fish, everything was vegan. <laughs> You know, because the Japanese traditionally, other than fish, really didn't eat meat. Um, this is something that's interesting. People don't know this, but for 1,200 years in Japan, it was illegal to eat meat. You were not supposed to eat a four-legged creature. It was it went against uh, royal decree. Um, and so it, they just didn't, you know, Japan really did not have a long history of, you know, Kobe beef. That's really relatively new, actually. And you, you, you are from japan right i think you were born there you moved here as a moved to the u.s as a child but you moved back as as a yeah, young adult yeah. right yeah as a young adult after i got out of college i wanted to get back i wanted to go back to japan to see the country where i was born and had been raised in the early part of my childhood and 
And, you know, I just felt like there was this big piece of my life that was missing um, from having moved to the United States when I was seven. And I wanted to go back and, and just sort of, you know, figure out what was that lost part of me. And what were you, did you start a career there? Were you going to school when you went back? No, I went, I went back initially. I taught English. Um, and then, um, I got a job at a laser laboratory where I was doing translations of, uh, <laughs> on Nevi and skin disorders of all things. Um, and then, um, I became a vegan, you know, during this period, I stopped eating a fish and stopped eating dairy products and I became a vegan. And then I started, um, that's when I started to explore how I could translate that into different businesses. And I started a bakery there, a, whole, a wholesale bakery. Okay. And you started the bakery and then at some point you decided to write, right? Were you experimenting with recipes before you decided oh, yes. to do it? Like, and, and then some way you would said it, I'll do a cookbook. Oh my God. Yeah. So I started having, you know, so I was a huge um, cheese lover, dairy lover, butter lover, you know, to me, uh, what, you know, Julia Child would always throw like a big knob of butter at the end of everything she made because it just made it better. And that was my approach to cooking. I, I cooked with so much dairy. It was ridiculous. And when I gave it up, it was like, oh my God, how am I going to replace the foods that I've grown to love so much? And it, it just opened up my mind. It was like, I need to start experimenting. And I just did a deep dive into exploring different ways to create those rich flavors that I'd gotten used to. And I started having these Friday night tasting menu dinner parties at a time when, you know, in the United States back in the 80s, no one knew what a tasting menu was. But it was all the rage in Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan was like 20 years ahead of the United mm -hmm. States in terms of high-end cuisine. Um, I mean, there were so many French restaurants. Apparently, Tokyo has more French restaurants, uh, more Michelin-starred restaurants than all of France. So, I mean, the, the Japanese just took the gastronomic arts very, very seriously. And I had just kind of grown, you know, used to um, just all of that stuff, really Epicurean things. So um, I started exploring. I started having these dinner parties. I started inviting people over to my apartment every Friday night for these 10, 12-course meals. Um, as I tried to figure out how to make, you know, replicas of mostly French cuisine, like how do I make these mousses and terrines and pâtés? And so I was experimenting with all of that um, kind of old school French cooking <laughs> and um, event, you know, one thing led to another and I started amassing all these recipes and um, I started getting featured in various magazines and writing some simple articles and recipes. Um, and I had this idea I was going to open a restaurant. Um, and I found a business partner and, uh, that turned out to be a total nightmare. It turned <laughs> out he was connected with the Yakuza, the Japanese mafia Not and a good my start. life, <laughs> it was just, no, my God, my life just was miserable. I was getting death, death threats at 3 AM people knocking on my door, trying to break in. Um, I, I, I was literally having to sign over my life to him. Basically anything I did, uh, back then I was like a, you know, uh, I was a, a bit, um, you know, kind of a, I, I sang jazz and night and died nightclubs in Tokyo also. You sang and, jazz and, oh yeah, my gosh, what yeah, haven't you, what I, haven't you done, Miyoko? <laughs> well, anyway, yes, but he wanted half of everything that I did. It didn't matter if it was writing a book or, you know, or doing one of my $50 gigs, he, you know, um, and so and for the rest of my life, I was going to have to basically sign in blood to this, to this guy. And then it turned out that he had all these connections and all these scary people started showing up at my house. And I went to the police and they said, you know, oh, well, you're not dead yet. I can't, we can't really do anything to help you yet. And, uh, I just had to get out of town and that's when I came back to the United States. But, you know, by then I had already amassed all these recipes and I'd actually written a book in Japanese that I wanted to get published in Japan, but he had made sure that wouldn't happen e either. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he basically any potential business deal I might have, he had called them up and told them that, you know, told some BS about me and, and, and killed all of that. He, he said, if I wasn't going to sign this, I was, he was going to make it impossible for me to ever work in Japan. Wow. So I came back to the United States. It was pretty heavy, but I, I had this, this big manuscript I had written in Japanese. So I, set about to translating that into English. And then I got it published. My very first cookbook came out in 1990. It was called the Now and Zen Epicure. And, and the cover was black with these um, pictures of like a pate en crude and these little 
um, little, you know, little appetizers. It was very French and brown and black. It was very weird. I mean, it's not, not the kind of food I would cook today, but. So um, did you, you, you translated it to English and you started yeah. shopping it around. Was that process of finding a publisher something that was easy or did it take a long time? No, actually, I only sent it the manuscript to one publisher. And in the, those days, you know, it wasn't online. You, you actually put a, a few chapters together and you put them in a mail and you mailed it out. And a few weeks later, I heard back and said, we'd like to publish your book. It was a really small publisher. Um, but it was the first one I sent it to. I imagine that there wasn't a lot of um, recipes creating plant-based dairy. And so you had put together this, this cookbook and you experimented a lot. Did you have anyone you kind of were inspired by, or did you do all these recipes? You had learned all these and did all this experimentation to put these together by yourself. Oh, my teacher was Julia Child. I, I literally worked my way through mastering the art of French cooking, um, you know, more than, once or twice or i mean i i learned all my techniques from reading french cookbooks um and a few italian ones too there were some other um french uh gastronomy books that i read as well to learn about you know re reduction sauces and and mirepoix and things that i you know when i was in my 20s i didn't know about back in the 1980s i mean american food was just like so you know i don't know early 20th century it was so just not, it was just wasn't very enlightened. And so I really, I'm really self-taught just from reading cookbooks, um, watching, you know, Julia Child on television. Um, I absolutely loved her personality, like so many other people. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got my start. And, and that really influenced how I cooked even today. And you got that first cookbook out and how did it do? Well, you know, back then there was no internet. There was nothing. Yeah. It still did well. I, mean, I think it was one of the, um, that and one other cookbook, I think were the, the first two cookbooks in the marketplace that uh, I would call more elevated vegan cuisine. Up until then, you know, vegan food was like, you know, the the um, the infamous lentil, lentil loaf or um, just things of that ilk that weren't very inspiring, um, not elevated, not not fine dining. And uh, so within like two months of each other, I think, you know, people tend to publish similar works at the same time without knowing that that's happening. That, that, that's happened before historically. Um, so I published that book. And within two months, there was another book that was of the same ilk by another chef. Um, and uh, I think it kind of began, I mean, I'd like to think it sort of began to change the approach to vegan cuisine in a, in elevating it a little bit more. And then you, you decided to do a couple more books, right? Eventually you, you had one pretty soon after or a year or two after that. Yeah. I wrote a book on Japanese cuisine. Okay. Um, that, that was easy. And then um, I think the, the break came um, and I didn't write for a number of years at about 10 years or so. And the break came with publishing artisan vegan cheese um, after about a decade of just playing around with vegan cheese in my house, trying to figure out, you know, how do I finally, this, to me, this was the last hurdle. I felt like I need to create a great vegan cheese. I've been vegan now for over 20 years and I still have not had a good vegan cheese. So how do I do that? And I started playing around with fermentation and I took cheese making courses and watch videos and, and, um, culminated in this book, um, which really kind of just changed the trajectory of my life, I think. And a lot of really just the perception of vegan cheese in general. And, and there are so many vegan cheesemakers around the world today that say they learned how to, you know, that this was their first entree into making vegan cheese and makes me, my heart s smile <laughs> actually to know that, I, you know, I was able to have that kind of impact. And we'll get into Miyoko's Kitchen eventually became Miyoko's Creamery, but you did make take a run at starting a company before that, now in Zen, which is named after, was it named after your first book? Was that kind of the idea? No, no, yeah, yeah. I wrote my book, The Nouns and Epicure, and then I started a restaurant in San Francisco, a vegan restaurant in 1993, I think, or four. Um, and that was called Now and Zen. And then that morphed into a company. I realized I was in the wrong business, and I just changed the business model and went into manufacturing. Um, and grew that to um, a decent size back in the day. I was making meat alternatives, uh, you know, before people knew what meat alternatives were. Um, and I had the leading non-dairy whip topping in the marketplace. It was called Hip Whip, 
And the tagline was, it's cooler than cool. At some point, the company didn't, I mean, it went out of business or you shut it down. What happened there? Oh, I sold it actually. Okay, you sold I, it. I mean, it, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest. I didn't sell it. I didn't make any money. I probably made 13 cents more than I was in debt for. I was in, it was um, at a time when I couldn't raise any capital and I'd grown the business to a point where I needed to build inventory um, and I was always in debt. Uh, I borrowed money to start the company. I had a few friends who were seed investors, but we're talking very, very small amounts of money, like $5,000 here, $2,000 there. So nothing really sizable. And I got to a point where I needed to actually start spending on um, infrastructure. I needed to hire people. I mean, I was kind of everything. I had a production manager, an office manager, and then um, then I was it. Oh, bookkeeper and myself. There were just four of us running the company. And then I had you know, a production team. Oh, I had, um, but I didn't have, I didn't have anyone doing sales or marketing or anything. And I needed to start building all of those departments. Um, I needed to be able to buy enough inventory to, you know, um, to be able to scale. And um, I couldn't raise any money. Um, And I was really just running the business to pay my overhead. Um, I didn't take a paycheck for years. Um, and I, I was literally, I, I was a, a young mom. I had three young children. I had a mother who was dying of cancer. Um, and then a father who, um, had some issues two years after that. And I was going to have a nervous breakdown if I didn't um, get out of the business. So, um, an offer came in, um, they knew my balance sheet. They made me an offer that covered the debt. I sold the business and uh, I closed a chapter of my life and I, I just decided I was never, ever going to start another business. It was just not, um, you know, I wasn't good at it. I was, uh, it was nerve wracking. Um, you know, I couldn't make anything really fly. So I just got out of the food business for almost a decade. So famous last words, you said, I'm never yeah. going to start another food business. Yes. Yeah. And you closed in 2008, 10 years later, you started Miyoko's Kitchen. That's right. So <laughs> what happened in those I, 10 years you decided to take another fly on it? <laughs> well, you know, I, I written the book Artisan Vegan Cheese, which I thought, you know, no, at the time when I wrote the book, it was published in 2012. There was no demand for high end vegan cheese. It didn't exist because no one thought it was possible. And um, it just didn't. You know, I thought no one's going to read this book. It's not it's going to flop. Uh, maybe, you know, a few thousand copies, but it's not going to be anything big. And it ended up being a huge success. Um, and next thing you knew, I was, you know, flying everywhere, giving demonstrations and talks. And people kept saying, oh, my God, I love your book, but I don't want to wait. You know, I, I don't want to ferment. I don't want to wait 20 days for my cheese to be ready. Can't you just start a company again? And I'll buy your cheese. <laughs> and I just heard that over and over and over again. And, uh you know, I was getting older. I was in my, my 50s already. Um, I was in my mid-50s by then. And I thought, it, you know, I can't just start. I just can't just retire now. And it's the end of my life. And I just never tried my very best at the thing that I'm most passionate about. I, you know, I can't go to my grave thinking that I didn't give it all, give it my all. Um, and so I just decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to give this one last shot. And um, boy, has it been a ride. <laughs> yeah. And this time around, capital came a little bit easier. You raised a million dollars in seed funding, I think from a former competitor in Seth Tibbet, right? Uh, of Tober- yeah, Tiberky, uh, yeah. He was one of the early contributors. It, yes, we raised a um, million dollars in six weeks. It, the money just came. It was so easy to find the money. And right now, in, we're in the middle of raising our third round, our Series C. Um and um, it, this is going to be a big one. And the money is there. I mean, there is a lot of people that are interested in this industry right now, which is really exciting. Um, you know, what's important is making sure you find the right partner who can help create the kind of future that we're trying to create. Um, but yeah, the money came has come very easily this time around. And the company has almost doubled in revenues every single year that we've been in business. Came easier in 2014, and yeah, we'll, we can maybe talk a little bit about how mm-hmm. there's there's just so much excitement about plant based. So, with that Series C, I would imagine there's a lot of people with an established entrepreneur like yourself that are interested. But going back to that that first million dollars and kind of going from your recipes that you you'd been writing books about and ultimately trying to create 
products, uh, you, you, you took some of this money and you, you had some growing pains. I think when you try to scale, I, I read in Forbes, you, you had that 600 foot prototype plant and you had to kind of go back to the drawing board. Yeah. Oh my God. It was, uh, <laughs> really a nightmare. Um, so when I first started, obviously it was in my kitchen, which is why it was called Miyoko's Kitchen. And then, um, you know, we got this prototype plant. We didn't call it a prototype plant. We thought that was going to be our plant. And it was about 4,000 square feet all in with office, um, an, an area that we thought was going to be a retail shop. We had a production space and then we had a warehouse. It was all under 4,000 square feet. Um, and um, I thought we would be, I, I mean, I went first, we first built it out. I thought, oh my God, we're never going to fill this up. And it was just crazy from overnight. And we knew a few months in that we were going to need a bigger facility. So three years later, we, you know, we finally managed to complete a new facility and we moved in and we had all this equipment, you know, the engineering part was really, really difficult because going from a 40 pound batch to either continuous processing or the smallest batch size now is 2,200 pounds, one ton. You know, the question was, how do we do that? Can you scale this product and have it turn out okay? Um, we had, you know, obviously we hired engineers to build this plant. And the first engineer came up with this model, which seemed absolutely br brilliant, completely cip -able, meaning clean in place. And you just basically push buttons and you had maybe one operator running this entire line. It just seemed like, oh, my God, this is brilliant. And then as, as I began to think about the functionality of each piece of equipment, I realized it was going to destroy the product. Um, and I just didn't want to spend, it was going to cost, you know, $6 million or something to put that in place. I didn't want to spend that money and then find that it didn't work. So we set about redesigning the facility, um, with a different system and, you know, obviously hired a couple of engineers for that as well. And we installed it thinking it was going to work. Um, and, um, this, there was one piece of equipment that I was still questioning, but I was willing to give it a try and it didn't work. And for the first couple of months, the product was coming out like soup. Hmm. Um, the cheese was not setting up. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a total disaster. We're never going to be able to recoup our losses. And investors are going to think we took their money. And what do we do? Um, anyway, we were able to make tweaks, and it worked. Um, and you know, today, I'm happy to say that we figured out the science. I mean, this is the thing is that – we're making cheese out of plant milk. So you think it's easy. Dairy milk is made from dairy. I mean, dairy cheese is made from dairy milk. You inoculate with cultures and enzymes and you, you know, you separate the curds in the way you press the cheese. Voila. Well, plant milk cheese is very, very different. It doesn't react the same way to the same enzymes and cultures and, and uh, processes as dairy cheese. You know, dairy cheese has had thousands of years to mm -hmm. figure out the scalability. Plant-based cheese, you know, we're talking not even a decade. So we had to really, really figure out how to scale this this product. How do we actually make this? How do we commercialize it? Um, and it was a very, very scary period, but we got through it. Um, and this is something that every entrepreneur, every vegan cheese company, unless you're doing it, you know, the old school way, most of the companies make it the old school way which is like, you know, the Deas of the world. Basically, it's very easy. It's made like processed cheese. It's You just combine oil, starch, uh, natural flavors, um, salt, whatever, in a big cooker, and you cook it up, and you pour it in, into a block, and then you slice it and shred it. Um, the whole process takes, you know, less than 24 hours. It's like two hour, every two hours, you can produce thousands of pounds of cheese. It's very, very easy. It's not, I don't know, to me, is that it's not really cheese. Yeah. It's a cheese replica, but, you know, I don't think hardened oil and starch, I don't consider that cheese. I consider cheese to be something that's made out of milk, that has cultures in it, that is made using um, techniques that uh, involve slightly time-honed ways, but also married with modern technology. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a coagulation of a plant milk. Um, that's been fermented and has nat has flavors that have developed through that process, not by a bottle of natural flavor. To me, that's what cheese is. Um, and, you know, I wasn't sure we'd be able to get it right because the technology was so new, um, it had been proven on the bench, but, you know, scaling it was, was very, very scary. So you had this idea to do the business. You put the business plan together, right? And, and you, you wanted to ultimately scale in these larger facilities 
the science and kind of the experimentation around creating those fermented plant-based cheeses, like you said, I agree with you, right? The, the, the other stuff is not what I would consider cheese. You, you need to ferment. Your recipes you had developed, and then you ultimately went to, to move to larger production batches. How much experimentation, how much work did you have to do in that, that process as you're building out the pilot production facility and eventually the bigger production facility? Were those recipes on the bench ultimately what you – largely what you went to scale with, or did you have to make a lot of changes? Well, the recipes that we made, um, you know, initially in the pilot plant, um, we were making 40 pound batches and I really didn't have to make many changes from the bench top okay. stuff. So that was easy. Um, you know, I had investors saying, Oh, I don't know if that's going to work, but that was actually very, very easy. Um, those are what I would call artisan batch sizes. Mm-hmm. And, and that worked perfectly well. It was when we went to continuous processing or, to you know the the one ton batches in the new facility where we ran into problems, um, and we did have to tweak some formulas, and we also had, to, but primarily we changed the process. We found that um, you know different um, levels of agitation versus um, different you know um, different temperatures for fermentation, all that s- stuff really impacted. We just changed the processes slightly uh, to get the the product that we wanted. Talk a little bit about like the magic of the plant-based cheese that you make, right? What were, what are some of the, the things that you feel are really important for, for yours? Is it the certain type of plant milk? What what are some of the things you did to make cheese that, you know, traditional cheese makers, cheese eaters from dairy would, would gladly eat yours. Cause I think it's, it's a great product, but I think, you know, a lot of people who come from the dairy side are saying, I'm not going to eat plant-based cheese. So how do you make it taste so good? What is the magic there? Well, I mean, I'll tell you right now, our VP of, of operations um, was the VP of operations at Tillamook, and he loves our cheese, and he is so proud to work here. Um, you know, and he's from, he's a master cheesemaker from Switzerland, and he's worked at all these big cheese companies, um, you know, running huge plants, multiple plants, and eating tons and tons of cheese. Cheese has been his life, and he loves our cheese. And what he loves about it is really what I love about it, which is that to make good cheese, you have to start out with a good tasting milk. If the milk mm-hmm. sucks, the cheese isn't going to be good. So initially, when I started, we started out with just cashew milk because I was trying to uh, n- uh, minimize the supply chain, not have too many different ingredients. Um, and so all of our earlier products were cashew milk based cheeses. Today, um, all the products that we're doing are um, based on composite milks that have multiple ingredients in them. And we're doing that. Um, so we might have seeds, nuts, legumes. Um, it's a combination. Mm-hmm. We make sure that all the milks are delicious by themselves. And once, and then we play around with a wide range of cultures. We have a uh, huge access to a library of cultures from different manufacturers because we reach that size when we can work with, with culture companies on developing proprietary cultures. We didn't have that ability in the very beginning. And it's just remarkable how... You can take the same milk and then inoculate it with, you know, 12 different cultures and you get 12 different taste profiles, not only taste, but texture as well. They completely change. So today we're, we're getting away from nuts, not that we're going to discontinue making nuts, but all the new product development is based around um, non, uh, more allergen friendly pro, uh, milk. So um, no nuts, but we, you know, we've got legumes, grains, potatoes, uh, various seeds. Um, and then we're concentrating on not only making a delicious milk, but a nutrient dense milk. So we're going after the ingredients that have the most nutrient density so that we can, uh, eventually get on par with, um, with dairy milk cheeses. Um, I have to say later on this year in the fourth quarter, we're going to be launching a cheese that, uh, does not exist in the plant-based space right now. And this cheese will have 10 grams of protein per oh, wow. serving. And that protein is coming strictly from the ingredients. It's not coming from protein isolates or concentrates being added to it. So, you know, we are, ho- we are re- really refining our technology to deliver um, the best whole food plant-based ingredients um, rather than adding, you know, this isolate and this starch and uh, this gum. So, you know, we, we were talking last week uh, about how, you know, Beyond Launch 3.0 and, you know, the ingredients list kind of adapts for them and they, they go to new versions. 
is it same? Is it the same from plant based milks? So, so as I hear you guys migrating away from from nuts and moving towards legumes, etc. If there's an established skew that like a customer loves, um, is this something that they're just gonna? Are they okay with um, kind of the ingredients list changing? Is this something that you have to kind of work with in educating the consumer? Well, we're not changing any of the current cashews. Uh, products. They're okay. going to stay the way they are. So that's not the issue. It's just okay. the new product innovation, Got it. the new products that we're coming up with. The only product that we're actually going to change and come up with a 2.0 are the products that we launched last year. We launched a cheddar and a pepper jack. This was our first foray into working with co-packers. We had, you know, everything until then had been manufactured here in our own plant. And um, let's just say we had to amend the rest the formula when we went to the co-packer to make it processable. And, um, you know, it, when we finally launched, um, it was less than a product that I was really proud of. Um, so this is something that, you know, most entrepreneurs wouldn't say, but, um, you know, I'm sure Ethan Brown, you know, I mean, the re they came up with the beast burger and it didn't go over very well. And that, that, and that, you know, they doubled down and came up with the beyond and blew, um, blew up, you know, blew away the, the, the beast burger. So I think, Every entrepreneur, you can do one of two things. You can sit in your research center for 10 years coming up with a perfect thing, or yep. you can just bring something to the marketplace that's pretty good, and then um, and then you refine it over time. And I think, you know, we're thinking of it more like the ladder, more like technology. Um, I, you know, I don't think we launched the best product last year. Um, so we've spent the last year improving on it, making it better. And later this year, we're going to be launching a version 2.0 of our cheddar and pepper jack. And they're going to be much more whole foods based, um, I think, much tastier. And I think the thing that I'm most excited about is that even our cheddar and pepper jack, even though they're much more whole foods based than the other ones in the marketplace, they still have natural flavor added to it. And that really made me upset. I did not, you know, I'm trying to put out a clean product out there. So our new pepper jack and, and cheddar have no natural flavor. The flavor we achieve the cheddar flavor through a unique wow. combination of ingredients and uh, the fermentation process. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and like all of our other products, it'll be certified organic. Uh, our two current products are not. So you know we were starting to go down this slippery slope. It was like I kind of feel like we made a mistake by even launching those two products. But it was like everyone else had slices and shreds. We felt compelled to do the same, and we did. And we did an okay job. I don't think we hit it out of the park. And so I want to correct that. I want to cor course correct. And we're about to do that. We're all, you know, we're not just about innovation. We're constantly about scrutinizing ourselves and, and trying to do better. Um, and so I'm really excited. I can't wait until later this year when we launch those. Um, the formulas are ready, but, but you know, it's, it's a long haul. It's like people go, why can't you get it out sooner? Well, because we have to get the packaging and then we have to get the co-packer to do – anyway, it's just it, – everything takes time. You know? the, the, the bigger you get, the more time it seems to take to bring products to market. Of course, and that self-scrutiny, I think, is what makes products so good. And so it sounds like you, you're increasing the protein profile – um, that you're you're removing those natural flavors and, and getting to the the cheat flavor through natural through fermentation and not having to add those flavors. Um, what are some of the other big challenges around plant based cheese? I know you know talking to grounded foods that you know they talked about mozzarella and how that stretch is still difficult. So are, you mm -hmm. know, like the stretch of of melty cheese is one thing. Are are there some other things you think are still difficult to get there with plant based? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think we're all getting better on the stretch part. Um, but we are really exploring how do we trigger a stretchy reaction in certain foods intact as they are rather than, you know, adding starches to it. Yeah. Um, there are plants that behave a certain way and exhibit a certain stretch and you can achieve that through various enzymes and cultures. And we're playing around with that. Um, you know, there are natural pro there are proteins and starch starches and plants that will uh, mimic that sort of dairy stretch. Um, if, if they're stimulated a certain way, we'll put it that way with, you know, with a particular enzyme or, or culture. And so we're beginning to explore that and we're hoping to improve on that. But that being said, we do have a unique product that we are selling. Um, it's, it's B2B it's for food service. And there's a bunch of pizzerias that, that carry this product. You may or may not know it, but it's a, it's a liquid mozzarella and it really creates this amazing stretch. Um, so you literally pour it on your pizza, 
um, and spread it around and you bake, it bakes up into this, this, uh, bubbly brown, stretchy mass. Um, and it's in a lot of, uh, kind of, we started out reasonably last year. It's in a bunch of high end restaurants and pizzerias, uh, in California. It's in a chain called pizza, my heart, um, and some other regional chains as well too. Um, but a lot of the better pizzerias are beginning to use that. Um, so food service is a whole area that we're just getting into. It hasn't been an, uh, a focus for us until fairly recently. So beyond the product innovation and, and the technology, there's so much innovation happening there. We could go on the whole for an, another hour. But, you know, with Miyoko's Creamery, you guys are a mission-based company. Um, and so I think there's a couple of interesting things there. One is um, the dairy farmer transition program that you guys are, are have developed um, where you're basically trying to help dairy farmers transition to plant-based crops. Can you talk a little bit about that, why you decided to undergo that? Sure. That was an effort to show dairy farmers um, that we're not the enemy, we're the solution. It's it's really funny. About three years ago, I was actually invited to speak at the International Dairy Foods Association Convention in Florida, and I <laughs> went there, and I was giving a, a pitch about our company, um, or not a pitch, but you know, to yeah. talking about us and to a group of uh, dairy farmers and processors, and I was afraid they were going to throw cottage cheese at me or something. <laughs> But anyway, I had this presentation, I was talking to them and, and it occurred to me, oh my God, you know, we could actually, we're not, we're not the solution. I mean, we're not the enemy because uh, the whole presentation was, well, I, was like, you can be part of this new economy. You have land, you can use that to grow crops, to become supply chain for this burgeoning new, new industry. You have facilities that could be converted to uh, processing plant-based products, et cetera. So it's, you know, we're not the enemy because so many farmers see the plant-based industry as you know the, the the industry that's crushing them and dairy farmers are struggling and i'll tell you i live in dairy land i'm surrounded by dairy farmers and i know dairy farmers and most of them would think they're doing they think they're doing god's work they believe they are feeding the world they're not you know they're not evil like a lot, they're not trying to destroy the world they're doing what what families have done for hundreds of years they're continuing this tradition most of them are you know multi-generational dairy farmers and they're getting they're you know they're at a point when dairy prices are plummeting they're getting what well, this one guy told me he's getting half the price he got 10 years ago for his organic milk um and and you know when 42 percent of their income comes from actual government subsidies that rather than uh selling milk and there's this major consolidation happening in the dairy industry they're struggling so it occurred to me why don't we try to help them? Why don't we actually create a blueprint where we become the solution, where we're a new pathway? Instead of you know the automobile just sort of leaving the horse and buggy behind, let's bring the farmers along with us and help them participate in this new economy. So um, you know anyway, um, so we we started you know talking about this and talking to farmers and kickstarting this program. And we had a part, uh, farmer lined up actually right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we're, um, it, everything kind of got put on hold, but we're, we just uh, kicked off the program again and we brought in uh, a new employee. Uh, she is the farm conversion manager and this is all wow. she does. So we actually have a dedicated person and we're going to, she's going to find the right farmer that we can create that blueprint with someone in California um, and uh, help them convert to crops. Um, she's been a farmer, so she knows how to do this. Um, and we're going to support that farmer through the transition. So we're allocating resources to supporting the farmer because they won't be selling milk. And then we'll figure out what do we do with those cows? They'll probably go to sanctuaries. You know, maybe I can take a couple for my, I have a farmed animal sanctuary as well. Um, and I, I have, you know, I've had two dairy cows to date. I have only one right now. One passed away, but so that um, that the resources yeah. that you're marshalling and the support you're yeah. giving them is that in the form of okay, ultimately you grow these crops, we will put these in into our products. That's one idea, or it could be part of a research and development project. For example, you know, we're thinking of what well, what if we could hybridize a certain potato with a certain starch profile that could go into our product. So it could be um, partly research and development, and eventually it could be part of the supply chain. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities, but we want to do is basically show that 
a proof of concept to show that it can be possible to, and then hopefully um, ha have other companies like ours help other dairy farmers. The fact is um, there's already a prediction that we're going to have a shortage of peas because you know there, the demand for pea protein is so high. Um, the same thing could ha would happen with oats. So we really do need to figure out other ways of, you know, uh, we need to get more people to convert. So folks listening in, I do want to take a couple of questions from the audience. So if you do have one, start thinking of that. But Miyoko, um, this idea of where you went to the Dairy Association and spoke is so interesting. You still see resistance from the broader industry writ, writ large. I think that's not surprising from large incumbents. And so you, I'm interested to hear a little bit about your perspective about after uh, going to court against the state of California, where they were basically trying to fight you from using the term butter and lactose free. I kind of see this as like incumbents fighting against the, the new arrivals. Talk a little bit about that battle and what you learned. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that was hugely interesting. You know, we knew that was going to happen. Um, and this is really about myself growing up uh, in the business. I mean, when I first started Miyoko's, um, I didn't have the word cheese or butter on anything. Um, we used the expression cultured nut product because the ca California had already told us when they looked at our packaging that we couldn't put cheese on the package. Um, and so, you know, we, we didn't. And that was really detrimental because if we can't call our product what we think it is uh, as a substitute for dairy cheese, um, but we had to put cultured nut product on it. How is a consumer going to know what to do with a cultured nut product? I mean, that's like a whole new category. It doesn't exist. Right. Um, and so over the years, we became bolder and we just started, we just said to hell with the state and the FDA standards of identity. We're going to call it what consumers call it. You know, nobody goes into a store saying, excuse me, where do I find the cultured nut product? They go in and say, where's the vegan cheese? So we decided to call it vegan cheese, and we started putting that on our packaging and the butter. I think butter got attacked because it's our number one best-selling product. And it's the best-selling plant-based butter skew in the entire country. Um, and so we were a target of that. I mean, we just got a big write-up in MSN.com about how fantastic our butter is. So, of course, we were going to be targeted. Um, so we got a letter from the state of California saying, you know, it was a seasoned business letter. You can't use the word butter. You also can't show any pictures of, of um, cows or livestock on your website or packaging, they said. And we had a picture of a woman hugging a cow and uh, on our website. And now we have a campaign called Milk Plants Hug Cows because that's mm -hmm. the mission that we're trying to promote is we have to have compassion towards animals. We have to change our perception of animals not look at them as evil methane producing machines, but we created them. So we better damn well take care of them and we better love them. So that's my perspective. And, um, you know, they, they have feelings just like us that, you know, they're parents and they have families and having an animal sanctuary, I can tell you acts of chivalry and humor and love and compassion that all these animals express. And I've hmm. seen it so many times again, I have so many animal stories I could fill up, you know, hours of podcasts just with <laughs> anim amazing animal stories. I won't go there right now, but anyway. So as soon as we got that letter from the CDFA, I knew that we had to sue them. So um, we teamed up with ALDF and um, Animal Legal Defense Fund. We filed a, a lawsuit um, on our First Amendment rights to free speech, and we won in a preliminary injunction last year. And right now, I think we're waiting for a summary judgment, and I believe it'll be in our favor. But anyway, um, we did win on you know, being able to show livestock um, and animals um, on our website and marketing materials. We did win on, um, on uh, um, vegan butter. And um, they finally conceded that most recently uh, on revolutionizing dairy with plants. Um, the only one that we fought to date is hormone. We, we had hormone free on our packaging and, uh, the judge ruled that, you know, apparently there's, there's plants, plants also have hormones. So that was inaccurate. Although we can say animal free horm animal horm hormone free. Um, so we're hoping that this is going to set a precedent for the rest of the, the nation. Although right now in Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin, Senator Tammy Baldwin, who's a Democrat, um, in the second biggest dairy state, California is the first, has um, has reintroduced her bill, which is called the Dairy Pride Act. And that would basically, you know, um, 
not allow uh, dairy replica companies, in other words, you know, plant-based dairy companies to use any dairy terminology at all. Uh, so that got shut down in Congress before. We don't know where it'll go this time. I think this is the third time she's resurrecting this bill. So interesting. I mean, I think from what I gathered, the, the, the judge basically said you were able under the First Amendment to basically use the terms. And he wasn't really impressed with the, the California uh, legal arguments. Uh, it makes you wonder if like, you know, if like back when they named peanut butter, if you had like a stronger lobbying effort, like, you would be able to call it peanut butter. Just kind of crazy. I don't crazy think me. so. No. Yeah. I mean, it is totally crazy. And the thing that really makes me angry is how much money the state is spending on silly things like this. Um, and it, you know, because I live in dairy land, I, I see what, what goes on out here, but you know, we, the state just granted, uh, we're a couple of years ago, actually, the state has spent 16, almost $70 million in grants and free money to dairy farmers to install methane digesters. In other words, taxpayers are paying to clean up the mess that cattle ranchers and dairy farmers are making. Um, it, the subsidies just don't stop for yeah, that industry. Yeah. I think we saw last couple of weeks, um, I, I, and I've talked about this with Seth from, from beyond, like how plant-based and has be in, in our diets have become more politicized. And you just saw, I think a couple of weeks ago that um, one party basically trying to kind of make meat a, a, a kind of eat meat eating, like a culture war issue. Do you think plant-based dairy will sidestep those culture war issues? Or do you think it's going to become increasingly politicized? I think it's going to be increasing and politicized for a while, but I think at the end of the day, the consumers are going to have the last vote. And they are voting with their dollars and they're voting for plant-based. So I think there's going to be, you know, so I think this is why it's so important to have a program like Farm Conversion to show, hey, we're willing to help you along. But you know what? I'll tell you, it's really not the large dairy processors that are fighting this. It's the farmers. It's the dairy farmers. Because if you look at it, Danone, you know, it's a big French dairy company. I mean, yogurt and everything else they bought silk and now they bought follow your heart um bell group in um you know of of baby bell bell group um uh bought a acquired a uh i think a french cheese vegan cheese company um there's a lot of investment dollars uh from large dairy companies in plant-based because they see the writing on the wall they don't care what their cheese is made out of. They don't care if it's, if it's made from, you know, the milk um, from a farmer or made from almond milk. I mean, I don't think they care because their business is making yogurt, making cheese, making CPG products. Um, it's the dairy farmers that are afraid of losing their livelihood. So we need to help them transition. So they come along for the journey. So you're finding a good fight helping to create this program. Do you think, we need to see more effort from these big traditional CPG companies that really don't necessarily care if it's plant. They do care, but you know, they'll happily transition to plant-based as long as they're selling product. Do they need to invest more and be good, kind of good citizens in the world to help their farmers and drag them, pull them along, not necessarily drag them along, but pull them into this I, I, modern space? You know, I think we all do. I mean, here's something that I've been thinking a lot about. There's, you know, every single day there's a new technology Everyone's got the latest, greatest. Everyone's got, you know, fermentation, this, that, and the other thing. And that's great. I mean, new food technology is wonderful. We need to solve the climate crisis um, and save animals. I got it. But I think we also need to think about the economy. What's the post-animal economy going to look like? How are we going to create a new food system that's going to be equitable for all stakeholders? Uh, Not just... Um, you know, for for workers, farmers, for um, everybody. And right now, I feel like the focus is on, it's all around what the product is, and it's all about investment, investment dollars. You know, it's going to make a few oligarchs that are going to replace the current oligarchs. Um, and is that the system we want, or do we want to create a more decentralized system? And how do we do that? How do we create companies that can create more equity um, as we go into this new chapter of food. Yoko, you know, I, I'm, I'm so excited that you, you 
kind of preview some of those these products that you're coming out with. What are some of the other things you're excited about? Are there other new categories you could see your company going in beyond you know cheese and butter? Well, you know, I get asked this all the time, but there is so much to do in the cheese and butter space. Um, you know, it's it, there's there's marketing. There's just I mean, it, so right now it turns out um, there's so little. Um, there was a, a study that I just read about. Um, vegan cheese and, and asking consumers, um, do you eat it and, and why not? And most people aren't even aware that vegan cheese exists. Over half the country is clueless about it. Um, almost everyone knows that Beyond and Impossible that you know plant-based burgers exist. But most people today, the majority of Americans do not know that vegan cheese is even a thing. So that means there's still so much work to be done. Joel, Joel's Kitchen came on stage. Joel, you have a question from Yoko? Yeah, I do. Hi, Miyoko. I'm a Hi, long-time Joel. fan. I love what you're doing. And I just wanted to ask you a general question. I love your farm sanctuary. When the fires were happening in, happening in California, you took so many compelling pictures of the animals not being able to get water and your challenges with vets and so forth, and also your um, vegan tours in Italy. I just wondered what a day in the life is like for you because you just have so many things going on. I am, I think you're Wonder Woman. How do you do it and what do your days look like? Well, let's see. This morning I got up and after um, reading emails, I went and bottle fed a couple of lambs <laughs> before I came to work. Um, and, uh, you know, I just uh, luckily I'm surrounded by a lot of people that support me wonderfully. I mean, I have a, a great executive team here at Miyoko's. I have amazing people that work here. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, I, Oh, I don't know what that was. Um, so I'm, I'm very blessed, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty busy, you know, weekends. Um, uh, I have a lot of, uh, duties sometimes at the sanctuary. Um, so, you know, oftentimes I've got animals and lambs and goats, in my, well, not goats so much, but lambs in my house or, We've got chickens or geese or um, I don't know. But to me, that's kind of where I, I find my 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 serenity, my peace, my um, my purpose. Um, and I, I just feel so blessed that I'm able to do that. And I have a new book coming out, by the way, um, uh, next week. Um, it'll be hit, hitting uh, store shelves. It's available for pre-order right now. It's called The Vegan Meat Cookbook. Uh, so it's it's all about. Um, how to use the vegan meats that are available in the marketplace right now, but also how to make your own. So um, it's the first book I've written in a, in a few years since the homemade vegan pantry. So I guess that's another activity, but, but, you know, it, um, I like to mix it up. We'll put it that way. Great question. And Miyoko, it's, it's kind of jaw dropping how much you get done in a day. Um, very, uh, very impressive. Um, Allie, welcome to the stage. You have a question for Miyoko? Hi. Yes, I do. So, um, Miyoko, I've been a fan of yours for a while with all the work that you do. And I always buy your cheese in the grocery store and the butter Thank you. and have some of your cookbooks. So I was really stoked to see that you were speaking today. Um, but I did want to ask you, uh, you explained some of the ways that you have kind of taken on um, some of the rules that are restricting vegan products from entering the market. Uh, such as the uh, natural or ferment, fermented, um, you said fermented product, like nut product, and how consumers oh, wouldn't recognize that as cheese. Right. Cultured nut product is what I called it in the very early uh, days. Yeah. I see. Okay. So one of my questions that I think about a lot, um, mm -hmm. I have a plant-based um, chocolate company, and it's in its early stages, but I would love to know uh, from someone who's been in the business for a long time, what are some of the things that are most impactful ways that small business owners can take on um, subsidies and take on these boundaries that that give benefit to the meat and the dairy industry? Like, what uh, what would you say are the primary spe um, steps that we can do to make a really impactful change because I think it's something that you probably learn by seeing and doing. Um, so just coming from your perspective of experience, um, where, what would you say to that question? Yeah. So if you, basically I would, I would not lie down. I would stand up. 
um, I would grow your company as fast as you can so that you actually start getting threats. I mean, this sounds crazy, but the, you know, the, the war, if, if we had remained really, really, really small, nothing would have happened. And I do know that there are companies, I know somebody reached out to me recently, a very small non-dairy or, or plant dairy company reached out to me. I mean, we're trying to change. We don't, I don't want to use words like non-dairy or dairy free anymore either. I want, I'm trying to use, I'm trying to even train my own psychology to say plant dairy because it's, it's a new, it's the transition of the dairy industry from cow's milk to plant milk. So that's how I think about it. And that's a language that I want to use. But, but anyway, this other plant milk, um, company wrote a young one reached out to me, um, saying that the state of California, um, you know, she was worried about her labeling. Um, she hadn't actually gotten a letter, but she was afraid she was going to get a letter. Um, I don't think she's going to now because we have have sort of set a precedent and we've heard that the people aren't um, getting as many letters. But I think you have to be bold. You have to stand up. Um, you have to push back. Um, there are organizations that can help if you're ever in that position. Um, there are companies that that can help like reaching out to me um or to companies that have fought this um there there's the you know there's the plant-based foods association good food institute um there are many resources that can uh show the precedents that are being set across the country um fighting this fight so you know not lying down basically and just saying oh i guess i can't do this uh don't do that um, because no we're not getting subsidies i mean that's the thing is you know these these dairies that are down the street from me are putting in these million dollar methane digesters that, you know, because they got the money from the state of California. I'm not getting any handouts from the state of California. I'm have you know, there, there's no slack being given. I mean, we do anything wrong. We get penalized. Um, so we have to, we have to level that playing field and we're not going to level it by just lying down and saying, Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so yes, you're probably, if you're little, you're going to need, you're going to need help, um, at least advice. And I would say, you know, reach out to the bigger companies. I mean, I'm in it to help out the entire industry. I'm not in it just for Miyoko's. I'm in this to save the animals. So it, that's going to take more than just my company. It's going to take your company. It's going to take a, a lot of other companies to replace the current structure of, of food. I don't know if that was helpful. But. Yeah, that was very helpful. And, and I have noticed on some of your packaging that you um, still use the word dairy. And I, I saw that and I thought, huh, I, I know that this is intentional. And, and then I thought about it a little bit more and thought, well, that's brilliant because I, those words do need to change. We have to be intentional. We absolutely have to think about language because food is evolving and language has to evolve too. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Thank you, and, and best of luck with your company. Thank you, Allie. Thank you for coming up. Joel, thank you for coming up on stage. And Miyoko, uh, I can't tell you how much fun I had this, this hour hearing more about your backstory and, and some of the stories uh, about you bringing this company to where you are today and fighting the good fight and moving towards that post-animal economy. Um, very inspiring. So I want to thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And we're looking forward to your book. It's out next week. What, what, what yep, date exactly? On the 11th. Is it? On the 11th. Yeah, oh, May 11th is re the release date. Yeah. So. Exciting. Congratulations on that. We'll thank all, you. we'll all be reading it. Thank you again, Miyoko and everyone for show, showing up. And if you want to listen to this again, it will be published as a podcast as well uh, for the food tech show. Just go to the spoon and you'll be able to see it in a couple of days. Thanks again, everyone. We'll talk to everyone soon. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.